Hello and welcome to another episode of the M121 podcast. Today we're going to continue in our summer sermon series with a sermon entitled The Nation Maker from Pastor Tim McCool of the Bethlehem Primitive Baptist Church in Ecola, Alabama. This sermon was recently preached on July 4th of this year and I hope you'll find it enlightening and encouraging as we think about our nation and who it is that sets up nations. We thank you that you listen to this program and we really appreciate the feedback that we've gotten from listeners over the last few weeks. May God bless you all. I would like to speak to you this morning, since we are actually worshiping on the 4th of July. It doesn't fall on Sunday every year. And if I have calculated correctly, and I'm not very good with math, as you know, but this is seems to be the 244th anniversary of the birth of our nation. And so I think it's appropriate, and I know some of you have heard this message before because I preached it a couple times but I can't apologize for what the Lord has laid on my heart. So hopefully the Lord will uh, bring it to my mind and to your heart and mind fresh. But I do think that it's appropriate to speak about God, who is the nation maker on this 244th anniversary of the birth of our nation. I don't think this is a message that you hear very much. God, the nation maker. Why do we have nations? What is the purpose of the nations? Why all of, you you might say, the division of nations? Well, there's very, very good and biblical answers for that. So on this anniversary of our nation's birth, we want to speak about the one who brought to pass the birth of our nation. And as American citizens, we should be acquainted with the history of our nation. If you are are not aware of the history of our nation, for whatever reason that may be, that is something that you can very quickly and easily become aware of. Dates and names and such is very easy. And I, I'm just telling you, as the days go by and, the, and the, the things that are going on in our nation continue, it's going to become more important and apparent why you need to know, have a working knowledge of the history of our nation. Now, This is not a message about the United States of America directly. It is about the reason a nation like the USA is here. It is because God is the nation maker. One of the founding fathers, John Adams, stated, and this is a direct quote, the general principles on which the fathers, founding fathers, achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. And I want you to let that sink in, that that is one of the founders themselves, one of of which has not been totally vilified and attacked just yet, although I I think in some way or another all of the founding fathers have been vilified and attacked. But out of his own mouth, he speaks and says that our country was, was founded on Christian principles. And today... Which is not surprising if you, if you know anything about the history of the way that nations go. Today, that is sort of flip-flopped to where we're not a Christian nation anymore. That, that is a fact. We are, we are a postmodern Christian nation. We are not a Christian nation anymore. We still have ancestors and a, and a connection to those that were primarily Christian in their mode of thinking. But it's very important to understand that the way the nation was born was out of the, the principles of Christianity. Now, let me say this. You, you would have to be blind or, or very ignorant to uh, not see that the attacks that go on in the non-Christian world, uh, in the non-Christian nation that we have today, against Christianity is a direct attack, attack on the way that our nation was founded. Okay? You just have to turn a blind eye to that to, to um, ignore or ignore that. So the proof of our national origin, it it just cannot be denied. And I give you another quote of John Adams, one of the founders, who wrote to his wife, Abigail. And he said this. It was written on the day that the Declaration of Independence was approved. He said, this day, the 4th of July, will be the most memorable epic in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. (laughs) And here we are today recognizing Uh, the 4th of July, all of those many years ago. Now, if God is the nation maker, 
If he is the nation maker, which I submit to you from the word of God that he is, he's the reason there are nations, then an attack against a Christian nation being founded is an attack against God himself. So a lot of times we want to kind of thumb our lapels and say, well, I'm an American and I believe in the founding fathers and blah, blah, blah. But understand that any kind of attack against a, a Christ, the Christian principles of a nation that was founded primarily as a Christian nation is an attack against God. Okay. So don't miss that. So, and also God is not an anarchist. God is not into anarchy, which means chaos and disorganization and undermining and rebellion and all of that type of stuff. God is not an anarchist. He is very methodical and organized in the way, obviously, because he's God in the way that he thinks and does things. So who is the great anarchist? Think about it. If you see anarchy in our nation or in the world, if you see governments uh, being plundered and falling and, and, and rebellion and all types of things going on, who is the architect of anarchy? It is Satan himself. Satan thrives on anarchy. He is the king of chaos. But don't ever forget that the Lord is over even Satan. It does not mean that Satan he is directing Satan to do this and to do that. God doesn't have to. But he is the all-powerful sovereign that is over even Satan. Uh, the devil himself. So, even so, it is alarming as citizens of a nation like ours to see the, the pointed and strategic and methodical, organized way in which the very founding of our nation is being questioned. So, as we consider that as a background, look to Deuteronomy 32 and 7. Deuteronomy 32 and 7. Deuteronomy is the repeat of the law. And this is where it's interesting that Moses is recounting a little bit of history for the people of Israel. And this is where we begin to see a clear picture of God who is the nation maker. Deuteronomy 32, and let's read in verse 7. Moses says, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee thy elders, and they will tell thee. Now watch the language. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance. Notice it says that God, the Most High, divided to the nations their inheritance. Now, specifically, he says, when he separated the sons of Adam. We're going to talk about those sons of Adam here shortly. But when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. That is interesting language, is it not? Let's break that down. Here, Moses recounts under the inspiration of God that the Lord set the boundaries of certain nations according to the number of the children of Israel. If God separated out some nations that He's referring to here, when He did that, that would have been hundreds of years before there ever was a nation of Israel. Y'all with me? So God says that hundreds of years before Jacob comes along, before Abraham comes along, before Isaac, before those guys come along... He separates the nations according to the number of what he knew would be the number of the children of Israel that would become a nation one day when they were led out of Egypt. Y'all remember that history, I'm sure. Hundreds, maybe a thousand years before that happens, God separated out the nations and he set the boundaries of the area of the promised land. God, there were all these ites living there. There were these Hivites and uh, other ites that lived there, different nations, Canaanites. He lists them out. You'll see when we'll look in a minute. And so it says that he set their boundaries and let them set up their kingdoms as far as possible that they could go and no further according to the number of what he knew would be the area or the space that the children of Israel would need one day. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing to me. Hundreds of years before, he sets the boundaries of the promised land and the Canaanites and the different ones that lived in there. He said, they shall go no further because this is the area that my children, my children of Israel, my chosen nation is going to need to occupy one day. Moses makes it very clear that God set the boundaries. And by the way, they're on the precipice of going into the promised land. Moses is recounting to them you're, the place you're about to go into, the boundaries were set for you according to your own number of the number of the Israelites. It was set hundreds of years ago by God because He's sovereign. He can do that. So God is the nation maker. 
And if you want to see the corresponding verse of Scripture in the book of Acts, if you keep your finger there in Deuteronomy and look at Acts 17, this is a quote from Deuteronomy that the Apostle Paul gives on the day that he preaches in Athens. In Acts 17, you notice where the, the Apostle Paul is up on Mars Hill and he's rehearsing to the ones, the uh, Athenians and the Greeks there. He's talking about God and he says in verse 24, God that hath made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshiped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. There the Lord expands what that means in Deuteronomy, that the Lord knows every boundary, every border, every part of every nation that's ever existed. Now the reason this has been on my heart and my mind so heavily, and the reason this is not the only time that I've spoken on this, is because there is an attack today by the architect of anarchy, Satan, for you to feel ashamed that you are an American citizen. That is a pointed anarchist attack. Say you you should be ashamed that you are an American citizen. You should be ashamed of your race. And by the way, I'm hoping that God's people will get back to talking in terms of what the Bible says because the Bible does not say there are different races. Did y'all know that? There are no races in the Scripture. It says there is one blood of all mankind comes from one blood. It does not define race. He, now there is definitely cultures and things like that define different ways of worship, different cultures define in the Scripture without question. And there's nothing wrong with being uh, happy over your culture or where you come from. You see, that is an attack to make you feel ashamed of the very fact that you live in a country where you can worship God freely. The reason this country is here is because of the nation making God. That's why this, God's people need to hear this. It's not, you should not feel ashamed to be an American citizen. Now that does not mean that you should not feel ashamed of some of the things that American citizens have done. Right? You should be ashamed of the sin that you have committed. And we should be ashamed of the sins that are committed by anyone. Because that's an affront to God. See? But God knew. Well, this was written almost 2,000 years ago. God knew that there would be a United States of America. And God knew when it would come to pass. God knew that it would be based on Christian principles when it, did, when it finally was born. And those many years ago on July the 4th. And also, God knows when it will end. Does that disturb you a little bit? Because this very, unless the Lord comes back very soon, it is very likely that this nation, like all nations that have existed, will end. And I think some of the stuff that you're hearing out there is the death knell of our nation. But remember this. God's the nation maker. He's the one that causes them to come to pass. And He is also the one that, that knows when their time has come. And God in the Old Testament raised up a few nations to be a whip and a, and a chastising punishment to His people. And when He finished with them, those nations went the way of extinction also. See? So we should not be ashamed that the nation-making God has made us a nation to live in. It does not mean that you're proud of everything that the nation has done. As a matter of fact... I'm more ashamed of a lot of the things that our nation is doing right now than the things that the ones are accusing that has happened in the past. It's more shameful now to think about some of the things that are going on. 63 million babies murdered? Are you kidding me? That's an oppressed group of people right there, is it not? Now, as I put this before you about God, the nation maker... It would be very good for you to go back and study through the Scriptures where the word nation or nations occurred. Because I think it would be eye-opening. It was for me. When you think about God as the maker of nations, and then you go back and you look at places, uh, you look at places like um, Isaiah, the second chapter, and Psalms, the second chapter, and it speaks of the nations. You know, it says in Isaiah, the nations are a drop in the bucket. Matthew, the 25th chapter, it says at the end of time that He will gather what? He will gather all nations to dispose of them as He will. You see? So we, we see that God has a special direct, directive and command when it comes to the nation. And remember that Israel was God's chosen nation in the Old Testament. So we think about that in terms of the nations now. What is a nation? In Acts 17, the, where it says, He has set the bounds of the nations... 
The word nation is the Greek word ethnos. You've heard of the word ethnic background. And it just, the root word of ethnos, it just means a group of people that have sameness. They have sameness. It doesn't mean they believe exactly the same thing or dress exactly the same way, but they have a, they have a sameness about them. That's, that's something that you should not be ashamed of, to have sameness. And as God's children, we certainly want to have sameness when it comes to our belief in the Lord. Okay, now look with me, if you would, to Genesis, the 10th chapter, as we define exactly what a nation is. And remember, this is not Brother Tim's definition of what a nation is. This is God defining what the nations are. uh, Genesis, the 10th chapter. And this is that section where it says, Moses was talking to the children of Israel, and he said, the Lord set the boundaries of the Canaanites according to the number of the children of Israel. This is where God does that. This is where the division of the nations came to pass. And guess what? It came down to three. It came down to the sons of Noah after the flood, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Genesis 10. Look with me in verse 5. It says, at the beginning, it says, these are the generations of the sons of Noah. Verse 5, and this relates to Japheth. It says, by these... People that are named were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands. Everyone after his tongue and their families in their nations. Then he goes on and talks about the sons of Ham. And if you look in uh, verse 20 about the sons of Ham, he said, These are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. And the last part there is about Shem, the son of Noah from which Abraham comes from. And he says, and let's focus in on verse 31. It's where we want to park for a few minutes. These are the sons of Shem. Now watch the definition of this nation that was created. After their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. There's three things, basic things that make up a nation. Number one, families. Number two, a language. That's tongues. And number three, a nation has to have land. It has to have property in order to be a nation. I read a few years ago, I don't remember exactly where it was, but it was overseas. And there was some, there was some uh, king that had been dethroned from his country. And he's, he was living in exile in a, another country. And they were letting him live there. But he's still king so-and-so, and he has no land. You see, you can't be a king of a nation without land. You've got to have land. That's what God says. Now, that's not not a politically charged or motivated definition. It is God's definition of what a nation is. God says He divided them by their families, by their language, and by their lands. He sent them in different directions. You say, where do we see all this happening? You'll see that in just a minute in Genesis 11. In the days of Nimrod, in the days of the Tower of Babel, it says that's when the Lord divided the languages. You want to know why people speak different languages? It's because God divided them according to the nations in different languages. Now, let's take up the first one, families. I heard one preacher, a dear friend of mine, put it this way, that we all come from, when it comes to families, you know, we're all, maybe you're interested in genealogy. I think the older we get, the more interested in genealogy we, we become because we wonder where we came from. Well, if you're wondering where you came from, we all come from a crooked farmer and a drunken sailor. (laughs) Okay, the crooked farmer was Adam. Adam was a crooked, lying farmer. It's set in the Garden of Eden to take care of the garden. He had one law to keep, and he broke that law. So if you want to say, well, I think I come from nobility. Well, if you trace it far enough back, you come from a crooked farmer. And you say, well, I don't really like that. Let's move a little further forward. Okay, then let's move forward to the drunken sailor. And that's Noah. (laughs) who went on the boat, the ark, and floated around for a little while. He, went, he really wasn't a very good sailor because it, it wasn't a sailing ship. It was just a floating ship. But he gets off the ark, and within weeks, he has raised the vineyard, and he has made wine, and he is drunk as a skunk in front of his whole family, making himself look like a complete fool, a drunken sailor. We all come from the crooked farmer and the drunken sailor. Now, I did a little research on McCool genealogy. I was hoping to dispel this crooked farmer and drunken sailor notion. And as I began to look into the McCool genealogy, thinking surely we come from nobility. You know, surely there's kings and queens and princes and princesses in our family line. Everybody thinks that. (laughs) Well, as I dug into the McCool genealogy, and I may have shared this with some of y'all directly before, but I dug back and the furthest back you can find on the McCool name was the legend of Finn McCool, F-I-N-N. Sounds kind of (laughs) Nordic. 
And so I thought, this is going to be great. Finn McCool, he had to be awesome. You know, he had to be incredible. <laughs> uh, you know, and so I, I start digging in Finn McCool and the legend of Finn McCool. And the more I turned the pages reading about it, the more I, I just, if y'all could have seen me, I was just going, I can't tell anybody this. I can't share this with anybody. This is too embarrassing. You know what Finn McCool was famous for? He was famous for the fact that he was a grown man and he would not quit sucking his thumb. So the McCool... Great heritage of the McCools comes from this magnificent, glorious thumb sucker. And as I sat there in disappointment and sadness over reading over what my great ancestor had done, sucked his thumb even as an adult, you know, I thought, oh man, this is terrible. And then I thought, you know, that's probably about right. <laughs> We're just a bunch of thumb suckers whining and carrying on and pity party. <laughs> So if you want to look in the history, now, I ain't even told you about the Springer side. There, there's tragedy on that side, too. I, I wish I could tell you there's some good back there, but I just can't. There's just not. So be careful when you go looking in your genealogy. Everybody thinks they came from some greatness, but you know, we, don't, we just come from some crooked farmer, drunken sailor, and, and unfortunately for us, some thumb sucker. <laughs> but your family is something that makes up a nation. Can we agree that the family is the thing that is in the most trouble today. The divorce rate is so high. The abortion rate is so high. You know, fathers not being fathers. Mothers not being mothers. All of these things that are going on. We can just go on and on about those things. The family being destroyed and manipulated and attacked by Satan is an indication of the fall of a nation. Because God said that nations are made up of families. So this idea of well, the, the federal government, the big government's got to tell me everything that I do. Let me tell you something. It comes down to families. Families that take care of themselves. Families that take care of one another. Families that love one another. Yes, we need a structure of government and we need protection. That's what the government's there for is to protect. But in order for, for big government to tell you what you can do and how you can act and whether you can breathe through a mask or not, I'm not trying to be political about this, but listen... Those are overreaching tendencies of a government. You see, the government is made up of families. See, you say, well, I don't have any power or authority. You're a dad, you're a child, you're a mom, you're a grandparent. God has, inv has vested you with authority <laughs> because you, you are what makes up a nation. Notice it also says that not only is it families that make up nations, but it's also a language. So it is perfectly normal to have a language. The language of America is English, okay? Perfectly normal to have a language. I was thinking about some of the European countries like, um, like um, you know, England and Spain and Germany. You know, they all have different languages. There's nothing wrong with that. God ordained a nation to have a language. As a matter of fact, if it ceases to have a language that in one sense it ceases to be a nation. Now the last one that he says, there are families and languages, a language and lands. In order to be a nation, a nation must have land. It must have land on which the families live, you see. It must have borders to that, to those, to that land. It must have boundaries. You see, that is something that God ordained. Not something that Brother Tim is making some kind of political comment about. It's something you need to know as a child of God that God, the nation maker, has set up nations. Now, you want to know why? The last question we'll answer in the last few minutes is why did God make the nations? That is, that's probably the easiest one to answer. You don't have to dig for that one near as much as you do uh, to understand what makes up a nation and, and what God sees as a nation. Genesis 11, this is the time in which the whole... Now watch the language now. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. You see, this was a time where they didn't, God hadn't separated out the languages yet. And it came to pass, they journeyed from the east. All the people are together. They're moving as one across the plain of Shinar, the land of Shinar, after the flood. You know, they're centralized in one area. The descendants of Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And you, you can list, it lists out who those are. And they're having children left and right. They're having twins. They're having triplets. They may be having quadruplets. And so there is just a population explosion going on. And there's one guy that rises from the midst of all of that, and his name is Nimrod. Now, Nimrod is used more of a joke nowadays than, uh, you know, something prestigious. But if you made a joke about Nimrod's name back in the days when Nimrod was the king on the throne as he set himself up to be a king, it was off with your head. 
You can read in Genesis 10 that Nimrod was a mighty hunter. He was a mighty man. And we don't have time to go into all the details about that, but basically what happens here is when the animals come off the ark and they begin to multiply, yes, it includes dinosaurs, yes, it includes lions, bears, tigers, all these different things, and they're in a centralized area. You can imagine that a few people got eaten up by these animals. And so they formed hunting parties and they formed defensive mechanisms. Nimrod is believed to have built the first city, which is Babel. And it had walls around it. So the animals, so the dinosaurs, so the Tyrannosaurus rexes, and so all of the uh, lions and tigers could not eat up the babies of the people and eat up the people themselves. That's a story for another day, an account for another day. But understand, Nimrod set himself up to be something. He's like the first king after the days of the flood. And so they begin to build the Tower of Babel. There's a lot of conjecture about why the Tower of Babel was built. I believe that one of the reasons they were built it is so that if they were afraid another flood was going to come. They had stopped believing the promises of God. God put the rainbow in the sky as a testament to the fact that He would never flood the earth again. So every time it rained and the rainbow came out, they just ignored that. Is that kind of similar to today? <laughs> the true significance of the rainbow? It is a testament to the covenant of God. It's not a testament to a wicked, sinful lifestyle. It's a testament to the covenant of God. And they'd stop believing in the testament to the covenant of God. And so they began to build them a tower and say, well, if another flood comes, it won't get us. We'll be up in this tower. God sees that. And he look at verse 6. It says, the Lord said, well, verse 5, the Lord came down to see the city which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one. This was a bad thing. And they have all one language. This was a bad thing. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. So God goes down and He confounds their language. And this is where the nations were formed. He he confounded their language, gave them all different languages. They went off and got different lands according to their families. So you want to know who spoke the same language? Shem and his family spoke a language. And then you had Japheth and his family speaking a language. And then you had Ham and his family speaking a language. And all kinds of derivatives of languages among them. They go off and start their own nations. Because God, why, why? Why did God confound the nations? It's so Nimrod couldn't be in control anymore. It was to thwart the murderer Nimrod. He was like some kind of mafia boss. He was like some kind of bully. Just like what they had before the days of the flood when there were all these bullies around. Here's another bully coming up and going to tell everybody what to do and tell, tell them they can't do this and can't do that. So God confounds that so the bully Nimrod will not be in control. There was a study done by a very prominent university, you can look it up online, about the number of deaths that occurred in the past century. 300 million deaths. Many of those perished in war. 186 million of the 300 in the last century perished in war. 150 million perished as a result of human decision. That's what the study said, human decision. What in the world is that? Well, part of that, a huge part of that, millions among that, were what was known as austerity campaigns. Do you know what that is? Is that a big word? An austerity campaign is what a socialist government does when they look around and they say, we got too many people, we can't feed them. So they starve them. That's an austerity, austere, austerity campaign. That's human decision. Now, I know it rolls over into this century, but think about the 63 million babies that have been murdered that are part of that human decision factor. Think about that. The reason that God set up nations was so that one individual like Nimrod or one nation could not control the earth and destroy the children of God. In the days of the Egyptians, remember, they tried to purge the Israelites. And in the days of Hitler, Hitler tried to purge the Jews. You think about the, uh, the plight of the Africans who were enslaved. And you think about a place like Rwanda over in Africa where one, one group tried to murder and destroy, commit genocide against another group. Did you know that there's a common thread among all of those situations? There's a common thread that in each of those situations, the Egyptians, the, uh, the, uh, the Nazis, uh, those that were in Rwanda, and even those that enslaved the Africans, they viewed that other segment of society as less than human. Every one of them has that common thread. They view them as less than human, not on the same level as other people. So therefore, you can justify, well, we'll wipe them out, we'll enslave them, or we'll commit genocide against that entire race. Because they didn't view them, they viewed them as less than human. Did you know there's still a group around like that today? It's called the unborn. (laughs) They are viewed as less than human. And so therefore, they are slaughtered and they are murdered. Because that comes from the king of of anarchy, Satan himself. Now, 
As we close, I encourage you to go back and look at those different occurrences of the nation in the Word of God. But specifically remember this as we close. 1 Peter 2 and 9, Peter says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, listen now, and holy nation. You see, God has a nation still. It's not the nation of Israel anymore, but it is spiritual Israel of people out of every kindred and tribe and tongue and nation, as Revelation says. And inside those nations is a nation within a nation. And it is known as the people of God. You see, a holy nation. You are that holy nation. A favorite hymn of mine, a common, a, a new contemporary Him says this, Though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one king reigning over all, so I will not fear, for this truth remains, that my God is the Ancient of Days. None above Him, none before Him, all of time in His hands, for His throne it shall remain and ever stand. All the power, all the glory, I will trust in His name, for my God is the Ancient of Days. You are a part of that nation within a nation. You belong to a higher organization than the United States of America. But on this day that our nation was born, based on God, the nation maker, will you celebrate with me? Will you glorify God with me that we live in a nation where I can preach this message to you from the Word of God and I'm not oppressed and I'm not uh, condemned or persecuted. And I'll be condemned, no doubt about that, but not persecuted for it, not arrested for it. Because in many situations, that is just not the case. We have an amazing nation that God, the nation maker, has founded. And we need to praise Him for that. It's got problems, major, major problems. And we may be living in the end of the days of this nation. But even if this nation falls... It ceases to exist. We can still sing praises to God, the nation maker, because of the fact that it was here for the time that it was and that we're still here in it today. So I encourage you, don't buy into the vitriol and the hatred and the things that are out there today and making you feel ashamed of being an American citizen. It's more than an attack against America. It's an attack against God, the nation maker, who has made the nation. And a nation is made up of families, and language and of property. That's what a nation is made up of. We should rejoice that God has established that primarily for the purpose of keeping the destroyer from destroying his children, that nation within a nation. I hope that this has been profitable to you. It's been on my heart, my mind, I guess, partly because of this being the birth anniversary of our nation. And I pray that as you hear the things that are going on in the world today, that you'll come back to the Word of God and let God be the one that defines for you what a nation is and how you should view your own nation that you live in. But most importantly, how you view the holy nation of God of which you're a part. And if you would like to become a baptized member of that holy nation, uh, we give you that opportunity as we stand and sing this morning. Do you listen to Grace Alone Radio Network? Grace Alone Radio streams the message of God's sovereign grace around the clock and around the world. Each day on Grace Alone Radio, you will hear Bible teaching from primitive Baptist ministers, encouraging a cappella hymns, and edifying passages from the King James Bible. Discover how you might access our programming at gracealoneradio.net. You'll be glad you did.